So today we're looking at a book that presents a number of weapons that were used in the turn of the century between the 18 and 1900s in England. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Joe and welcome to my YouTube channel, Fighting Words, the Martial Arts Library. On this channel I review martial arts books and talk about other martial arts related subjects. Today I'm going to be reviewing the book Broadsword and Single Stick by R.G. Allenson Wynn and C. Phillips Woolley, which I might be mispronouncing. I don't know if you guys notice, I'm a little conscientious about my pronunciations and I don't like getting them wrong. Anyway. On to the book. Uh, the version I have was on PDF and uh, I found it through Google. The copyright on that one is from 1905. However, uh, I've seen other sources that say that the book was originally published in 1890. Now, Alison Wynne was, among other things, a baron. Uh, he was a highly educated individual uh, he was an engineer, he was a world traveler, he was actually a convert to Islam, which was sort of significant at the time. He was an avid student of the fighting arts. Uh, he has a book on boxing, I haven't reviewed that one yet, but it's, it's coming down the pipe, you know. Um, so most of these chapters are written by him. Now, Mr. Phillips Woolley was an author. He was originally born in England and transplanted to um, Canada. Uh, another gentleman who, you know, w might have been characterized as an adventurer at the time, you know, world traveler, uh, big game hunter. He was really into sports you know, played cricket, among other things. His contribution here is the chapter on the single stick. So this book, despite its title, um, covers not just the broadsword and the single stick, but also a variety of other weapons, mostly impact weapons and pole arms, I guess you would call them, perhaps modern-ish pole arms. And as such, the first chapter is actually on the quarterstaff. Now, the suggestion is that the quarterstaff should be about eight feet long. The text suggests that the quarterstaff gets its name because one of your hands is gripping it a quarter of the way down, and the other hand is gripping it more towards the center, I believe. There's talk in this chapter, as with all the other chapters, about you know the history of the quarterstaff. Uh, there's also a lot of attention paid to uh, the type of equipment one should be wearing. Um, in this case, it sounds sort of like coupled together. Uh, there's, for instance, a, um, a sort of a fencing mask and helmet, but also you wear boxing gloves to protect your hands when they get struck by the stick. And also they advise wearing um, like leg pads from Cricut. A lot of the things in this book are basically how to gear up and train with one another. And this sort of sets the tone for that. Now, there are no photographs, strictly speaking, in this book. There are several sketches, uh, and that includes um, a, a diagram of the various blows and guards, which you can think of as blocks. I'm sort of glossing over a lot of this. The book itself is very dense with information. Uh, it's sort of told in a bit of a long-winded prose. You know, there's like little tangents for stories here and, you know, like history, which seems a little dubious at times there. Um, but as such, when I'm telling you what's in it, I'm, I'm sort of rushing through a little bit. Uh, you, following that, you have the chapter on broadsword, and that includes grips. Uh, he, he advises different sorts of grips. Now, bearing in mind when they're referring to the broadsword here, a lot of people will envision like a medieval sword. 
at the time this was written, uh, and they say it plainly, a broadsword is basically anything that's not a small sword or a rapier. So we're talking things like, you know, sabers and cut and thrust swords and cutlasses. And he says for the lighter type, you can have your thumb pressing against the back of the grip. But if they're heavier, you're going to need to get a more solid grip. A significant part here is that, you know, this is a sword, unlike the small sword of rapier, which is primarily designed for thrusting, this is designed for cutting. So he really makes a big deal about getting a lot of power into the cut, but also being able to draw a cut and spends actually kind of a lot of time making the distinction between hitting and cutting. You know, a, a hit falls flat, a cut will have a bit of a draw to it. And it's the draw, the friction of the blade against the target, that is actually biting in to the surface of the target. You know, I, I do like that he's emphasizing that point, you know, and pointing out that, you know, some people can perform some parlor tricks basically just by hitting, but you really need to get that draw in order to use the blade effectively. Uh, the bulk of the back of that chapter is on drilling someone in the use of the broadsword, and these are very military-style drills. Like, you as an instructor are calling out commands, and he lists under each command exactly what the student is supposed to be doing. Following that is the single stick chapter, which of course is Mr. Phillips Woolley. That's his specialty. Single stick, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, it is sort of analogous to a foil. So they actually use the analogy in here, a rapier that has a point and a very strong spine. You can simulate that with a foil, which is sort of floppy <laughs> and doesn't carry as much weight behind it and has a button on it so that it's not pointed. The single stick is sort of meant to simulate a broadsword. So there's a lot of strikes. I mean, they are hits and not necessarily cuts, but it's roughly the same length as you would find a broadsword. And typically they also have a hand guard, usually made out of leather, that simulates the sort of hilt you would find on a saber or another type of broadsword. And again, they go into... Um, safety equipment, you know, the type of attire you should be wearing, um, rules for competition. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on sportsmanship and acknowledging the other guy's hit in this particular chapter. Now, following that is a short chapter on bayonet, and again, it's got history of bayonets in there. Um, it has sort of a theme through the book, a, a little bit of you know, British military propaganda. <laughs> it's just, it's sort of an underlying tone throughout the book. Um, there's any chance to present some nationalism is there and also maybe teeny tiny bit of racism. Um, and it's typical of a very long-winded style that you would get around this time. But concerning the bayonet, you know, they do show various tactics with the bayonet. You, as you can see through these illustrations, uh, they prefer to grip closer to the butt of the rifle, which is different than I've seen from more modern bayonet manuals in, like, military manuals. Uh, this is, you know, obviously because of the subject they're covering, this is definitely for the military, and that includes um, tactics that they've mentioned against cavalry which isn't something you're going to find if you're just like, you know, using this against someone similar to you, as in the other chapters, you know, where you were gearing up and you have a training weapon and you were sort of competing against one another or contesting things. Um, there, there's really not much in the way of that for this chapter. And finally, the last little chapter is on what we might consider everyday weapons. So, it, it, although they're all, there's a theme. So we have the cudgel, the shillelagh, the walking stick, and the umbrella. 
and that's it sounds like a lot of stuff to cover and there are differences in the construction and use of uh, these particular weapons but they all have a lot of stuff in common they're all blunt primarily and they are things that one might carry every day as opposed to like an eight-foot quarterstaff. <laughs> so this chapter is more focused on the self-defense aspect of things. Um, one thing that he talks about to sort of contrast, well, this is how you would use this and this is how you would use that. He really doesn't like sword canes. I uh, doesn't like weighted canes, which I guess there were at the time, you know, they would have some lid shot in the cane to add weight to it. And he just says that those are too slow. Um, again, maybe this is my 21st century, you know, brain reading all this, but there's also some anti-Irish stuff in there. <laughs> Talking about how... You know, maybe the Celtic skull is thicker than the Saxon. Like, okay. After he discusses the use of these various uh, items, he actually goes over awareness just a bit and emphasizes that. So he actually ends it with this particular quote. Let me conclude by saying that if you want to be as safe as possible in a doubtful neighborhood, your best friends are a quick ear, a quick eye, a quick step, and a predilection for the middle of the road. The two former help you to detect, as the two latter may enable you to avoid a sudden onslaught. So, even back at the turn of the last century, there was this emphasis of, you know, awareness and creating an opportunity to evade an assault, as opposed to, you know, Let's get out there and try to hit the guy as hard as possible. I mean, there's a time and a place for that. But, you know, the object of, of avoiding violence is to avoid it altogether. And it's nice to see that that is a consistent theme through self-defense manuals. <laughs> As far as the pros of this book go, uh, I do like that it is systematic and consistent. You know, as I said, there are, you know, similarities between the single stick and the broadsword and even the, um, even the use of the quarterstaff as far as your general tactics. Um, you will get a progression, you know, we're going to drill blocking, and now we're going to drill hitting. And I also think from an historical perspective, it's sort of neat to see, you know, the the systems that were in use during the Victorian era, sort of, you know, getting close to the, the waning years of the British Empire. As far as the cons go, it's mostly in terms of the prose. Uh, it is sort of archaic. It sort of meanders at times, you know, like they will go off and tell stories in the middle of a paragraph. And you're like, I thought you were going to teach me how to hit somebody with a stick, right? Um, you know, again, there's that very nationalistic, you know, we're English and proud sort of angle to it. Um, and past that, there are limited illustrations. I mean, I, I think the ones that exist are enough to sort of give you an idea of what's going on. And there are several diagrams, you know, like a circle with the different, you know, strikes and blocks depicted in it. It, it would have made the book better if it had used more illustrations. So who would I recommend this to? If you are interested in Victorian era weapons, <laughs> um, this is sort of on the tail end of the HEMA spectrum, that's historical European martial arts. Um, this is about the time that ended what we might consider the historical era, but you will find useful things for that in here. 
Uh, I think if you are into stick and staff fighting, I sort of am, that the sections on the, um, the quarter staff in particular, but also that last sort of grab bag chapter talking about, you know, cudgels and umbrellas and stuff, I think that that might be useful. You could use parts of it for self-defense. You know, like I said, I think that last chapter works pretty well for that, with the caveat that most people do not, in modern times, carry around a stick, a walking stick or a cane with them. Um, but you might. So if you do, there might be some useful information here, and you can probably find the entire thing on Google if you like. So mostly I see it as good for historical value as opposed to more practical value, unless you specifically practice HEMA and related things. So that's my spiel. And thank you guys for listening to me. Um, except for the, the little racist parts. It, it was mostly an entertaining read. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Sherlock Holmes fan, so I've read a lot of Sir Arthur, Kern Sir Arthur Conan Doyle stuff. So the prose sort of reminded me of that, even though for an instructional, I do find it sort of long-winded. But who am I to talk? Anyway, thank you for watching my video, and I'll see you guys next week.